interaction uh, between atoms and uh, the radiation field in a cavity. This is the reason for which uh, cavity QED uh, manifests many body effects in low dimensional models. And this is why I think cavity QED can give an insight uh, into certain, uh, certain imp important uh, many body uh, effects. And I, th I hope that I can give an example when, when we really learn something from a cavity QED approach, something which is uh, uh, more general than... Uh, Sorry, Peter, can you take the mic a little down? Because yeah, okay. Really anyway, I'm, I'm loud without this microphone, so... So, and in this example will be the critical exponent and what is the, nat what is the uh, underlying reason for, for, uh, uh, for certain numbers that we get in case of a quantum phase transition. And I also join a, a band that, and many others who mentioned that the, one of the uh, inherent part of cavity QED systems is that uh, it's an open system because typically we coherently drive the system by lasers or microwaves. And uh, uh, on the other hand, on top of the parasitic dissipation, uh, there is always a controlled way of outcoupling the excitations from our system for measurement purposes. So this measurement part, quantum measurement, which has a back action on the system, is an inherent part of cavity QED. And in some sense, I, from this point of view, that we interrogate our system and we want to learn something about the system, this I find more natural than to create something in, which is a Hamiltonian, a ground state of a Hamiltonian. Um, and there, there is an, uh, self-organization is a good example that uh, phase transitions can be uh, observed in such a setting, so phase transition of the steady state. Uh, there are several experimental groups from uh, Zurich, they were the first, and then uh, Hamburg and uh, Stanford, where the symmetry breaking transition from one steady state to the other steady state while scanning a control parameter, which was in that case some driving laser, either the intensity of this laser or the frequency, leads to this abrupt change. And uh, there is a critical point which is uh, identified, and in this critical point, the fluctuations diverge, just as in the normal case of uh, ground state uh, quantum phase transitions. And in, there, there are several var variants of, of this phase transition. And the, what, what is interesting that uh, these uh, fl uh, diverging fluctuations follow a power law as usual, and this exponent is one. And uh, the experimental values, they measure this exponent in Zurich, and these ex uh, it scatters around one. So one, it's calculated and also measured. And the very simple question which I want to uh, raise here, that why is it one? It can be half, three quarter, 1.2. So what is the reason that it's one? And to answer this question, I will use a very simple model. It will be based on coupled harmonic oscillators. But it, this, although this model is very simple, it has some element of reality to describe a real system because uh, the self-organization phase transition maps to the Dickey model criticality, and this toy model is very close to the Dickey model. I will, uh, let me just go through very briefly and fast through the Dickey model quantum phase transition because I will use the concepts later. So the Dickey model is a, is a spin boson Hamiltonian. Uh, a and A dagger can represent, for example, a cavity field mode, and S is a large spin, just as uh, Monica showed that this is uniform for example, atoms which are uniformly coupled to, uh, to, a, cav to a cavity mode. And uh, there is an XY coupling between the two. There was a pointer, right? Uh, yeah, so there's an XY coupling. And at a, at a certain value of this coupling, which is the geometric mean of the eigenfrequencies, uh, this the ground state of this Hamiltonian uh, changes. So below this critical point, we are in the normal phase where there, is no, there are no photons and the spin is down. But above this critical point, this, there will be some spontaneous polarization which compensates for the self-energies. 
The usual way of solving this Hamiltonian is that we can invoke the Holstein Pivakov representation of the spin and then uh, reporting, and then we can separate the mean field and fluctuations. And the, the mean field can be determined by minimizing the mean energy and the residual part of the Hamiltonian describes the fluctuations and here you can see this two mode squeezing term which is the reason for the diverging fluctuations. You can also notice that below, okay, the, the, the mean field part is, uh, this is shown as a function of the control parameter which is this coupling. So here is the critical point, the mean field is zero below and then it goes up. And below the critical point, uh, the last term vanishes. So we have only these two coupled oscillators and this will be the Hamiltonian I will use later in the second part of my talk. So I will concentrate on the normal, normal phase of this DP uh, type uh, criticality. How this simple model comes about in the context of many atoms in, cavi in a cavity. So here is again a simple model that we have uh, a light field mode in a, a single mode in a cavity and the, met and the quantized matter wave the kinetic energy and the collisions. These collisions we will neglect most of the cases and the interaction between the, f the field mode and, the, and this uh, article called atomic gas is described by these two terms. So one of them is a light shift, so the resonance shift of, 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 the, fo uh, of the cavity mode which is proportional, uh, proportional to the density of atoms. And this is an inter interesting term because uh, this couples a laser light into the cavity, so it is scattered via, again, the density of atoms. And uh, this uh, interaction inherits the mode function of the cavity mode. And on purpose, I kept here this time-dependent terms to emphasize that this is a time-dependent Hamiltonian. So we are in an open system. And of course, we can get rid of very easily from this rotating terms by going into a rotating frame. and then we get the time independent Hamiltonian, but in a rotating frame. It's very important to know that we drive the system. There are photons which can come into the, uh, into the cavity. Uh, now uh, there are two terms which dominate the atomic motion. But one of them is the homogeneous one, and the other one which uh, matches the mode function of the cavity. So assuming that all the atoms are somehow in these two modes, then we can introduce the Schwinger representation for these two bosonic modes and we get the light spin. And reporting all these identities into this Hamiltonian, neglecting the collisions, one arrives at the Dickey model. The Dickey model now there, and, and going into rotating frame. So the frequency of the, of the photons is virtually this detuning. Although this is a high frequency mode, but in the rotating frame, uh, and Owing to this driving, we, we get a low frequency uh, mode. And this is the recoil frequency for the, for the density waves, and here we get the coupling. There's an additional term which is not so relevant because it does not change the critical point. It's important to see that now we have two parameters in this model which can be easily tuned experimentally, and one is detuning, so the, photo, the effective photon frequency, and the other one is the coupling which depends on the strength of this driving laser. Now, the, as, I, as I already emphasized, that the driving is somehow hidden, so this looks like a time-independent Hamiltonian, but we cannot forget about the driving and the dissipation, which is a sort of measurement, so the photons leak out from the cavity, which we can model with the, this uh, simple uh, linear loss, assuming only this as a dissipation channel. There is a photocurrent through the system, so coming from the laser into the cavity and then they go to the detector. And this is still a solvable model, so one can solve it easily. And for the mean field, we get this self-organization. So below a certain power of this driving laser, the condensate is homogeneous. There is no scattering into the cavity. Uh, the mean fields are zero. Above a certain threshold value, uh, there will be a scattering and the, the atoms occupy this cosine mode, uh, cosine, uh, uh, mode function. And the critical point uh, uh, is, uh, is modified. 
with respect to the, uh, to the ground state DQ model, but this is an innocent, complete innocent modification. This is just a renormalization of the detuning. And using this critical point now, the ground state, the solution for the ground state and the steady state overlap. So th there's no difference between uh, the ground state mean field solution and uh, the steady state mean field solution. And here is the ex experimental uh, uh, mapping of the phase diagram. Uh, one variable is the, the pump power, the other one is the cavity detuning. So for a fixed detuning, increasing the power, one crosses the threshold and the system enters in the super radiant phase, which is which th there are many photons there. Uh, this is the uh, oh, we are in the mean field uh, description, but it's not true there are no fluctuations. So fluctuations are uh, important also in the uh, uh, in the mean field description. So one can calculate the the fluctuations, so the number of these photons and the, the population on the excited mode as a function of the control parameter. For reference, the thick line shows the mean field, and here we see this uh, uh, divergence of the fluctuations, and this time we see a, a marked difference between the ground state fluctuations and the steady state, both for, for the photon part and the atomic part. And what is the nature, so as I said, for the ground state, we have the two mode squeezing. For the steady state, we have the dynamical equilibrium of dissipation loss. One can also interpret the origin of these uh, fluctuations as a quantum measurement back action, as an uh, older paper by uh, Stamper Kern group. So this is a completely different mechanism of populating uh, the mode. And we, if we compare these two divergences, we uh, plotting on a log-log scale, one can see that the ground state has an exponent one half and the steady state has the exponent of one. So this is the one I, I uh, uh, anticipated at the beginning. So this is the, uh, what uh, the theory says, a simple theory as this one. And this, these are some experimental curves. First of all, here showing the uh, divergence of, of the intercavity photon numbers close to the critical point and uh, then uh, it's not, it's a log log scale over two orders of magnitude. There, there's a fitting which gives 0.9 and the more recent paper there are uh, two different exponents for on the left side and the right side but they scatter around one. Uh, one, one, one interesting uh, observation in this plot that actually the, the exponent is the one which we expect for the steady state solution, so one. On the other hand, the solution itself is closer to the ground state fluctuation. This would be the steady state, the dash line, this is the ground state. And then the, the author, so, uh, Esslinger group, they also identified the reason for this. And the reason was that there is an additional loss channel in the system, which is probably, probably uh, associated with the coll collision of, of, of atoms. So somehow the density wave mode, so this B mode has an additional decay which they modeled in the very same way as uh, we did for the photon uh, loss. Actually, this is not a consistent way of doing it, but phenomenologically, one can uh, uh, make such a uh, simple assumption, and then one can fit uh, the experimental observations with this gamma, and this, they, extract, they extracted uh, a, a loss rate for, for these density waves. We did a diff being theorists, we did a different approach. We tried to calculate it from, from a microscopic theory. So now we added this collisional part of the dynamics for, for, the, for the matter waves. And, but this gives rise to a horrible problem. So because initially we had only the, uh, so now the, the mode function includes much more bosonic modes. Originally we had only the homogeneous one and the cosine mode coupled to the cavity mode. So this gives rise to these polaritons. But now we have all the long wavelength phononic modes uh, which, which are populated due to collisions. And then uh, one can, uh, we, we included the, in this theory uh, the following scattering processes, the Landau and Belayev damping, uh, the, the processes which lead to Landau and Belayev damping. So now with the, all these modes, phonon modes, we have this usual dispersion relation folded into the first billowing zone. 
So this is the quadratic relation except for the very low uh, quasi-momentum where it's linear. And then the, one of the interesting processes the, which underlies the Landau damping that here is the polariton. The polariton frequency is not here because of this mode softening. So increasing the, the coupling, the mixing between these modes, it is somewhere here, this red dot. And it can, this mo, uh, polariton can uh, mix with, with a phonon on this low branch and create a phonon on this upper branch and put an atom into the condensate. This is one process. And the other process is the Belayev damping, where this soft mode uh, spontaneously decays into two uh, phonons. One of them uh, is on the lower branch, the other one is on the upper branch. The quasi-momentum is opposite. So one, uh, actually, this process has to obey three conservation laws. One of them is the momentum, this is why uh, this one is on the upper branch, this one is on the lower branch, the conservation of the quasi-momentum, and also the conservation of the energy. So the height of this one plus this one gives back the height of the soft mode. So this is an over-determined process. Very, uh, it's very, very weak. Except at the band edges, because at the band edges, this is a linear relation, and therefore a wall interval obeys this conservation. So once there is a point when this soft mode frequency comes down where uh, this process is enhanced, and this is what we got in the calculation, that there is a peak in the Belayev damping. Here this plot shows the, uh, the loss rate as a function of the control parameter. Here is the critical point for various temperatures. So the gold one is Belayev damping, the blue one is Landau damping, and Landau damping uh, is, is very sensitive to the temperature because this phonon mode has to be populated. So this calculation somehow uh, explains the resonance that was observed in the experiment. Quantitatively, it's not very good. We, we don't expect to be very uh, accurate quantitatively because uh, certain approximation that we had for this calculation, so we assumed an inhomogeneous BC, infinite BC without trapping and uh, we didn't take into account the photon field is lossy, so there were several drawbacks of this model. And at this point, we abandoned. So we realized that it's extremely difficult to calculate microscopically, and we changed the strategy, and this is now the uh, where the interesting part of this talk starts, because I will consider this very, very simple model, which, which can be general, but somehow we can think of of the physical system that I have described so far. So the, this is something like a photonic mode, this is something like a, a motional mode, and these are coupled. And I assume very generally that this mode is a genuinely high frequency mode which is driven externally. So this frequency is a reference to a laser, a high frequency laser, and then this mode decays into the continuum, continuum at a high frequency. Whereas the other mode, which is this motional mode, is a genuinely low frequency mode, and for this one, I keep uh, the interaction with the reservoir. It's a, some general linear interaction with reservoir modes, and all this can be embedded in one quantity, the spectral density function, this rho omega, that combines somehow the coupling strength to the frequencies as well as the density of modes at the frequencies. So all, all together, we have something like this. But now we are at low frequencies, so it's very important that what's happening in the vicinity of the zero. So usually, usually we are used to Markovian picture, which applies for the mode A, because it has something similar, but we sample this, that, uh, this reservoir at high frequencies, and all the relevant dynamical frequencies of the system give just a very narrow band where this is a, uh, a constant, and then we get the expo Markovian exponential decay. Now, keeping still the generality, I will make the following assumptions of this, uh, of this function. I, the, gamma is simply a dimensional parameter which um, somehow uh, gauges the strength of the coupling. The heavy side function ensures that there, there, are, there are no negative frequency modes in the reservoir. And then I keep a completely general power low with an exponent s. And the denominator is just for 
for uh, for uh, regularizing uh, at high frequencies. The high it's a high frequency cutoff. It will be not relevant. Actually, this there's a classification of such a, a, a bath spectral density function. Uh, we can call it colored reservoir. S1 corresponds to the ohmic limit, and then uh, there is a subohmic and superohmic. So the ohmic is uh, specified by that the uh, friction force is uh, linear as a function of the velocity in the caldera legat model. And when, when S is uh, smaller, then it's, uh, uh, it's a lower uh, power of the velocity. So then the work that we did that using this density uh, mode function, we can calculate the self-energy. And the analytic form is here. So it's a tedious calculation using analytic continuation. Uh, you can see that in this uh, uh, self-energy function, the real part and imaginary part are somehow mixed uh, in a way which depends heavily on the exponent of our reservoir in a non-trivial way. But what is the meaning of the self-energy you know, it it uh, it appears in the if we considered this uh, mode without interactions, this would be the green function. So we have here the self energy, and uh, for a Markovian case, typically this function is has just a, 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 a real part, which is the shift of the frequency, and an imaginary part, which is the loss rate. For for, the, for, for us, it's very important now that this self-energy depends on the frequency. So, okay, one, but it's not a difficult problem. It is just a technical part I skip. It's a good book. Uh, it's an appropriate bookkeeping system of the green function, this Kaddish uh, formalism that we use. We can extract various uh, green functions, uh, and the calculation is fully automatic. It's just matrix products and uh, uh, calculation of Gaussian integrals. So let me now show the results. First of all, let us look for the poles of this retarded green function. Now the green function is a four by four matrix. It has four poles. I show uh, two of them, which develop into the soft mode, uh, so which vanish uh, near the critical point. The so red curve is the is uh, the re re reference it's a reference curve for for gamma zero so this is when there is no color reservoir and you can see this the softening of the mode of the real part then it vanishes at a certain point and here the the imaginary part is already initially zero because this mode is not damped but at this point there's a bifurcation and here is the critical point where this uh, uh, decay rate vanishes, and this is the asymptotic decay rate that uh, Andrew Hook uh, uh, showed. So this is the critical point, and actually there were measurements on, on this uh, mode softening uh, in the Esslinger group. Now when we switch on the interaction with the colored reservoir, we get the blue curve, which shows very similar behavior. As you see, now the bare frequency is, is different because this colored reservoir shifts significantly the frequency, and also there is an imaginary part, but more the, but the more as the behavior is the same, and the important conclusion that, that the critical point does not change, so that it's independent of, of the presence of this colored reservoir. The, the reason is that at zero frequency, so when the, when the soft mode comes, when the go, mode goes to zero, that zero frequency, there is no, uh, the, the action, effect of this reservoir vanishes. The next important quantity is the, uh, this is not, uh, uh, sorry, this is not uh, a measurable quantity. So we, I call it soft mode, but later I will argue that this does not describe the dynamics. So it's a nonlinear, it, become, it becomes a nonlinear system, and therefore these resonances do, do not uh, describe uh, the effect and the, the, uh, the effect of criticality. So what is really an important and measurable quantity is the power spectrum of cavity photons that I show here. Uh, sorry, just I can show what, what, what will be next. I will show the, the spectral density function for zero uh, coupling, somewhere in the middle at the intermediate coupling, and somewhere here very close to the critical point. So for, for, for zero coupling, and this is the uh, blue dotted line, we get simply a Lorentzian. So this is a Lorentzian. This is the bare cavity uh, uh, 
spectrum. And then for, for intermediate couplings, we have the green line. And now with, because of the mixing uh, into a polariton, so mixing with the motional mode, the B mode, we, we can see these two low frequency uh, symmetrically to zero, which, uh, which correspond to, to, to this and that fr frequencies. And then these two coalesces, so very close to the critical point here, we get a single peak, and this peak diverges. So this goes to infinity as we approach closer and closer the critical point. Now, uh, somehow, if, if, we, if we do this continuously, there is this color-coded plot. So as, as a, this is the frequency, and now this is the control parameter from uncoupled system to the critical point, and the, the color code shows somehow the peak height, and uh, there's a overlapping white curve that is exactly this uh, soft mode, uh, I'm sorry, for this blue, blue one, and there's a good overlap. So we, if we are not close to the critical point, so we are, then, then this soft mode seems to be at the correct place. The same can be calculated for, the, for mode B, now for mode B, the, uh, the uncoupled case is the blue again. So you can see that below zero, there is no uh, uh, power. So of course, so this is, this is far from a Lorentzian resonance because this somehow uh, maps this colored reservoir. The overall behavior is the same. So we have the double two peaks and then this red one which is uh, when, uh, very close to the critical point, and this is very far from a Lorentzian. Now, what, what, uh, uh, how can we uh, determine the critical exponent? Uh, one option could be that we see, we, 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 we uh, calculate how this soft, what is the power exponent that the soft mode, the imaginary part of the soft mode frequency goes to, to, uh, to zero. This could be one exponent, and this would be wrong. So correct way to calculate is that we integrate the area under this curve. This is the number of fluctuations, the total number of fluctuations for various values of the coupling going, to, approaching uh, the critical point, and we calculate how does this integral uh, uh, diverges. So this is sh shown here, which is the main result of this, plot, of this uh, presentation. So for example, we take a certain value concentrate first on the inset. So we, crack, we take one coupling, which is very close to the critical point. There we uh, integrate the photon number, and uh, we, uh, then we choose a, another uh, control parameter value, and so on. And uh, we fit a, uh, a straight line. This is a log-log plot. We fit a straight line. This gives us one uh, uh, value. And then we change now the exponent of the, uh, of the colored reservoir density spectral function, and we repeat the same calculation. So all these curves correspond to different uh, colored reservoirs, and then we put all this into this continuous plot. So this is the exponent of the colored reservoir, and this is the critical exponent of this divergence, how the fluctuations diverge, and you can see a very non-trivial uh, 